The story with WeWork was one guy who's a remarkable salesman. He was so charismatic that all of these staffers, a huge amount of the tech press, a lot of the smarter investors in the world lost grip on reality. And suddenly, this thing they believed in wasn't real. company went from a $47 billion valuation to near bankruptcy in just six weeks. It's been a kind of a phenomenal story to watch. We over me. That was the motto of WeWork, the tech company once valued at over $47 billion. It was led by CEO Adam Newman, who had a cult-like following within the company, and Adam had access to rich investors, celebrities, and high-profile people due to his wife, Rebecca, who is cousin to Goop founder, Gwyneth Paltrow. In this video, we'll explore the rise and spectacular downfall of Adam and Rebecca Newman and their company, WeWork. And I've said that WeWork was the most overvalued private company in the world. Adam Newman told us repeatedly that WeWork was profitable. We've since found out that how Newman and WeWork were considering themselves profitable was a stretch at best. This will touch on the money that funded the company having origins through Rebecca's father in tax fraud and stolen cancer charity donations, but we'll be more heavily focusing on the fact that they screwed over their hardworking employees. Because we work was just flushing cash down the toilet, just hemorrhaging hemorrhaging money so we had to cut job he wrote something like ha bitches i cut more than seven percent of my team because everybody's supposed to cut seven percent and filled the company with every type of discrimination you can possibly think of rampant sexism racism homophobia pregnancy discrimination it's all there and they made some weird videos everything about the videos was propaganda everything about it was propaganda the tone deafness and lack of awareness to show these videos it was incredible basically you had the ceo you had all the ceos and you really didn't see any minorities up in the higher echelon there wasn't proper diversity we were period hard stop and they absolutely screwed the employees they didn't even have weekends, holidays, nothing. They worked all hours of the day and night and they didn't even make a livable wage. Adam promised them all equity down the road and being a lot of younger people who this was their first job out of college, they listened to their boss and they thought, I work hard now, I get this equity, I'm going to be in the money in a couple of years, when in reality, it's very, very rare that you actually make significant money from equity given to employees. It's kind of like a lottery win. There's those stories about Amazon employees, but for all the one hit Amazon employees, there's a lot more people who've basically got a couple of hundred or maybe $2,000 out of equity from their company. Adam told me I was going to be a millionaire. Most people agreed to salaries less than they would make at somewhere else in a regular field or whatnot because you were given a salary and a certain value of stock options. The Newmans weren't just satisfied with screwing their employees over and having them work all hours of the day and night, but they wanted to control every aspect of their life and would even make flippant overnight decisions that employees could not eat meat on property. So even if you brought a sandwich with meat in it, you couldn't eat it at work and you certainly couldn't expense it. The only person allowed to do that was, of course, Adam Newman himself. Employees were laid off in absolute droves because the company could no longer afford to pay them due to Adam's 
absolutely reckless spending to fund his own high-flying lifestyle. This was a company that was burning at one point $100 million a week. Think about this. You could buy two Bombardier Global Expresses at $50 million each, crash both into a mountain, and that was the burn every week of this company. All of this in combination with a host of other disturbing practices, the Newmans just wanted to build their own fortune to dizzying heights while driving WeWork into the absolute ground. When the reality of what was going on at WeWork was exposed and the company tried to cut themselves free of the Newmans, the Newmans doubled down and proved that beyond any shadow of a doubt that they are two of the most selfish narcissists that have ever lived and wanted to screw over the employees, the investors, everyone one last time and get one hell of a payout to go away. And we'll talk more about that at the end of the video. So we'll start right where everything started for WeWork, which is in 2010. And over the next nine years, WeWork grew and opened on six continents and in 30 countries. And for all intents and purposes, it seemed to be a success. But as most of us know, when something is too good to be true, it generally isn't. So Adam kept up this charade of WeWork was this tech company. It was, you know, redefining how people use space. But it absolutely was a real estate company. And they'll admit to that now. But back in the 2010s, Adam was telling people it literally was a technology company. So it's almost like you're a real estate company wrapped in this sort of, in, in this tech uh, sheen. So definitely not a real estate company. We are a community of creators. We create environment for entrepreneurs and freelancers. We leverage technology to connect people. And uh, it's a new way of working. And just like Uber is the sharing economy for cars and city bike for bicycle, right. we're the sharing economy for space. Do you buy the property? So we definitely do not buy the property that again would make us a real estate company. Exactly. We create long-term leases with landlords and then we take the space and we break it up and we create the community and the connections that happen between our members. And that was just absolutely not the case. They basically took a building, took a lease, took a long lease, say 10 years, and they would lease the entire building and they would break it up so that someone like Microsoft could come in and rent an entire floor or I could come in and rent one desk. And because they were breaking these leases into little chunks, they were obviously raising the price and that was it. They were basically like a middleman for leasing and breaking them up into, you know, pods or desks or floors. And that was it. There wasn't some big complicated tech something going on in the background. Adam didn't even use a computer. So there was no sort of mystique. What actually is it that you do? Are you a co-working space? Are you a real estate company? Are you a technology company? You know, I feel that uh, defining, a lot of times in companies you have to define exactly what you are in today's world to build a meaningful brand that's actually going to last for a long time and make a difference and do a lot more than just make money. Not that making money is not very important. Also, you have to be a little bit of everything. We're a company that builds communities. We have our mission, our main thing that we do is curate and create culture. And to do that, you happen to make physical space. They talked a lot about these softwares that they employed in the buildings, but WeWork employees admitted, you know, all the software did was was tell you people like to sit by windows and I think we all know that and coffee stations have long lines I mean they're pretty self-explanatory so there was nothing else going on I mean it's it's kind of amusing now to go back and look at him speaking and talking about all this technology when in reality they are a leasing company that's all they do there's, you know, nothing fancy about it. So even when when Adam started with all of this, like it even all started with lies and deceit because 
he didn't actually have the idea himself. He took it from a classmate's son who already had a similar business. And he even went as far as going on tours of the building as if he was going to lease it. And basically he took the paperwork as if he was going to lease from this company and he used the paperwork and just copied it and changed the company name to at the time it was green desk and then we work so it's just from the beginning you can you can just see this guy's true colors and that's because in many measurable areas like global square footage members locations countries revenue and profit IWG is either similar or much higher than WeWork, except of course for one area, valuation, where WeWork was valued nearly 13 times higher than IWG. And Adam and Miguel actually had a third partner at the time, a real estate investor called Joel Shriver, and he kind of got screwed by them as well because when he wanted to come in he said you know how much to to kind of buy into the company and based on absolutely nothing like adam pulled this number out of the air he said for 15 million and joel shriver didn't even end up getting the percentage in the end that he was owed but that immediately gave adam and miguel money to get started and most of the money that they used in the beginning was Rebecca's money. So she got a huge inheritance from her father who was found guilty of tax fraud and stealing from cancer charities. So she put over a million into WeWork and Adam is a, is a very good salesman. Like that's why he was able to do this. Because he can get anyone to do whatever it is that he wants them to do and what he sees in the vision. But people like Rebecca, especially who have had a rich father and never had to work or do anything, and then now has a rich husband, like they've never worked or lived in the real world or know what it is to, to be like a real functioning member of society. I would go to interview Adam. Rebecca was there for a lot of the interviews. Sweetie, can I just say something? How do I pause this? You don't need this. She was um, grilling me about my intentions with the story. We work is going to make the neighborhood cool. We work is going to make the Lower East Side the new Silicon Valley. Clearly, she had a lot of authority, but she was not considered at the time a co founder. And the fact that she was able to fund the company with like a million, you know, if there's a lot of people in the real world that if they didn't have to work and you gave them a million dollars, they could come up with a great idea and make a great business too. It's, it's just the fact that most people have to work to pay their bills so they're not able to get a million dollars from their wife to start their own company and that's why all these Adams and Rebecca's and all these people think that they're so amazing and special that they started this company but if most people had the resources and you know step up that they had in life then a lot of people would be really successful because if you watching this were given a million dollars and a college education and you didn't have to work and you were able to solely focus on starting a business like you too would be successful most people given resources like this would be successful and adam talks a lot about how you know he wasn't privileged and he grew up in this kibbutz and things like that and I, while he probably did grow up in a kibbutz like he had his entire college education paid for and he had a number of companies before we work that didn't work there was like a baby clothes sales that had knee pads on baby's clothes and his grandmother gave him a hundred thousand dollars for that again a lot of people given a free college education that they don't have to work while they're in school and they were given a hundred thousand dollars when they got out to start a business a lot of people would be successful with those resources. And not only was he given, you know, 
all of this money. He also was given connections, which you can't buy that sort of thing. Rebecca, I mean, as far back as when she was in college, people said that she, you know, if somebody's introducing themselves as, oh, hi, I'm Ash, that she would always make sure she got the last name in there because her maiden name was Paltrow. And I mean, any interview I've ever seen anyone talking about it, they say nearly the first thing out of her mouth is that she is Gwyneth Paltrow's cousin. She is uh, a cousin of Gwyneth Paltrow. You can't go far hearing about Rebecca or talking to Rebecca without that kind of coming up. And I mean, we've all seen Goop also, haven't we? So this sort of swindling runs in their family it seems to me like the more i study goop the more i'm just sadly impressed with how they are able to get people to spend money on this stuff who are these rich and privileged people who will buy into anything who are buying all of these items off of the goop website how did they find them they are so blatantly selling the most ridiculous stuff and people still buy it so in the beginning, Adam is still telling people that this is a technology company and right around, you know, the, the early mid 2010s is when people had seen the success of Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all these things. Through the 2010s, Silicon Valley was throwing money at disruptive tech companies because you had a few people really drive these companies to enormous heights, there became essentially this meme that Silicon Valley creates the cult of a founder. And so people were looking to get in on the next technology company. And Adam was still telling people that it was a technology company when it absolutely was not. I didn't know if they were not going to tell investors. They certainly were lying to every time they put out something in the media. Are you actually turning a profit in we the business? We are definitely turning a profit. I'm bored of the businesses that don't turn a profit. I don't believe in them. I need a cash flow positive business. So the company was growing and burning money. There was only actually one year that WeWork made a very, very, very tiny profit. And that was in 2013. So by 2017, Adam knew that he was using up all these investors. So people were giving him money to fund the company. And he was using the money to fund this insane, insane lifestyle. And I don't mean like he had one or two really nice houses. He had multiple, multiple million dollar houses, like not two, three million, like way, there was one that was 38 million and just the most insane things. Like he didn't fly anything but on private jets and there was so much other stuff that, that we'll get into in a minute. But in 2017, he knew that because the company was burning so much money, he'd used pretty much all the big investors and banks. And so he needed a big, big chunk of money, of capital. And there was a company led by a Japanese billionaire called Masayoshi-san. And Masayoshi-san was in charge of the Vision Fund, which the Vision Fund is the world's largest tech-focused venture capital fund. And Masayoshi-san, his company is called SoftBank, and SoftBank is in charge of the Vision Fund. So another company that SoftBank and the Vision Fund have invested in is Uber and Alibaba. And Alibaba is really their big success story because Uber has obviously a lot of people know lost a lot of money and there's also a littering of companies that went the same way as WeWork. So in 2017 the Wall Street Journal reported that the SoftBank group was weighing an investment of well over one billion dollars in WeWork. When they raised money in SoftBank at a 20 billion dollar valuation and at that point they had about 200 locations 
I went through and looked at the buildings that they actually had their facilities in, and I determined at that valuation that the 200 buildings were each worth less than that WeWork office was being valued at it. And I said that WeWork was the most overvalued private company in the world. So knowing that SoftBank and the Vision Fund had well over a hundred billion dollars of capital. Adam was putting all his eggs in one basket, like he wanted this money from Masayoshi son. So Adam invited Masa to WeWork and Masa was supposed to come obviously at a certain time and the time elapsed and 20 minutes goes by, an hour goes by, more time goes by, and eventually Masa arrives and he says, Adam, I'm so sorry, but I only have 20 minutes until my next appointment. You can ride with me in the car if you want to. And so Adam says yes, and he starts to pitch Masa on WeWork and Masa is one of those people that he kind of goes on like his gut, which judging by the way the Visions Fund's gone recently and not too great, but Adam and Masa are having this conversation about WeWork and Masa basically says to Adam, in a fight, who wins? The crazy guy or the smart guy? And Adam says, the smart guy. And Masa says, no, the crazy guy, because no one wants to get into a fight with a crazy guy. And a lot of people report the story as Adam saying the crazy guy, but an interview he did recently, he did say, no, I got it wrong. And Masa basically said to Adam, I'm going to give you $4 billion. And so Masa, when he said this to Adam, he was like, you're, you're crazy. That that's great, but you're not crazy enough. When I give you this money, go absolutely crazy. And that's exactly what he did because all he did when he saw that money was think, oh, I can increase my insane high lifestyle even more. With the SoftBank money, WeWork is able to massively accelerate global expansion plans. SoftBank unlocks Asia in a new way. You know, this meets Adam's big ambitions. And he went crazy like there's no other way to put it he was buying up houses and property like it was going out of fashion he bought a 60 million dollar jet and and this is all on the company's money and everything was being funneled through the company he was buying buildings and renting them to his own companies. He was buying buildings and then asking WeWork to lease those buildings from him. And then he took $700 million out of this company at the very time he was asking the public to put money in the company. He was profiting insane amounts of money from his own company. He even bought trademarks to a lot of company names like We Bank, We Grow, We This, We That. And he then turned around and sold the trademark back to the company for six million dollars. It's it's absolutely wild that he was allowed to get away with this, but he was in charge. He, the board of directors, let them do whatever he wanted and all he cared about was his own enrichment. I mean, the growth was insane. You know, sales guy comes to me, it's the last day of the month and, you know, I really have to do this deal. It's, it's 800 desk, it's gonna help us to get to the goal. You know, I look at the deal and it's like, you know, first eight months free and WeWork's building custom space and the response was, you know, get them in, they love it, they'll grow. And, you know, I come to find out that the small company that can't afford to pay for the 800 seats for eight months is Microsoft. So we're going to move into part two of this video now. And part two is talking specifically about Adam and Rebecca's behavior 
after they got this money from the vision fund and what I would describe as a sea of red flags as to what goes on and specifically some of the things that were being done at the company that should have been absolute alarm bells but while the company was being overly valued nobody seemed to want to raise the alarm. So I wanted to make this video because over the past couple of months I have just been absolutely fascinated with WeWork and the Newmans and everything that's gone on. I read two books, Billion Dollar Loser and The Cult of We, which were both excellent. If you like this video and you want to know more, then I highly, highly recommend that you read them because they go into far, far more detail. And while I've tried to extract some of like the biggest things from those books. They are both really great reads. And I also watched the Hulu documentary that is the $47 billion unicorn. And there's also a episode of Generation Hustle. I think it's episode two that's called The Cult of We. And it's an hour long look at WeWork. And they talk to a lot of the employees in both of these documentaries. And they again, do a really great job of going over everything. I've used some clips from both the documentaries so you get a taste of what they're like, but I would definitely check those out as well. While I was in the process of making this video, while I was doing the research, Adam actually did his first interview in like two years and I wanted to do this video now because I think what he's trying to do is trying to get ahead of the mountain of stories that will inevitably come out because there is a Apple TV show coming out really soon. They finished filming it based on Adam and Rebecca and it's starring Jared Leto as Adam and Anne Hathaway as Rebecca and I mean it's an Apple series with two big actors. I'm sure that it's going to get a lot of attention and I think that Adam's trying to get you know, out in front of some of the stuff that's going to come out because even, I mean, I have spent countless, countless weeks researching, reading books. Like I've read every article there is. And even the interview that I saw with him, knowing all this stuff, I was, it for a few seconds, I was like, ah, I can see that. And then I'm like, no, no, like he, he's a really, really good manipulator and really like he, he is a good salesman and he, he does have a way with like talking to people. So I want to make sure that there are other people out there talking about this because if you go on, even on YouTube, like there really aren't people like YouTubers talking about WeWork. There's lots of like news articles and like financial shows talking about it. But outside of the two documentaries and the two books, there's there's not an enormous amount of people talking about it. So that's why I really wanted to get out before the TV show too. And of course, just want to put this out there so that I don't get sued, but everything in this video is alleged. As I said, most of my sources are from the two books, pretty much all of the, the articles that I've read, which are below. And I've also listened to a number of interviews with people that are in like the Hulu documentary and stuff like NYU business school professor Scott Galloway like these people provided a lot of really great insight so I'll put everything in the description box. The main reason that I wanted to make this is because Adam is absolutely pushing this false narrative now. I meet my wife I was 28 this was 10 years ago and she looks at me and she goes literally within five minutes you have a lot of potential but right now you're full of shit. <laughs> You have potential, but you're full of shit. You, my friend, are full of shit. You have a lot of potential, but you're full of shit. 
and I don't want people to forget what they did and that they literally walked away, not only scot-free, but as literal billionaires. And they keep trying to paint things very differently in the press. So again, I just wanted to put this out so that at least it was easy for people to find when the inevitable Google searching starts whenever we crash comes out because I'm sure people will be really interested once they see the miniseries. One of the biggest things that I took away from this story was just how badly the employees were treated because Adam and the all-male executive board and nearly anyone in any sort of good position in WeWork was a man. I have to fight to stay here. Like, I, I felt constantly like I couldn't just breathe. Adam would say, I could fire all of you and do this by myself. That's a bold statement to say to people who are working their ass off for you. And Adam was very open with the fact that he he literally said that he thought nepotism was great and he employed mainly like his family members, Rebecca's family members. At some point they changed the organizational structure to have like mini CEOs in different regions and they call them CWOs. So <laughs> I'm not kidding you. The CEOs are people who just want to talk about their awesomeness. They have that very much in common with Adam. It was almost like you needed to know who was at the top so when they came past, you could bow down to them. And the WeWork employees all had very low salaries. And Adam famously said, like, if you hire people, work them really hard, get them to that breaking point, then it's fine as long as you get nine months of employment out of them. And the way Adam got these people to work these 60, 70, 80 hour weeks for really low pay, like even non-livable wages, was to promise them equity. They were brainwashed in the sense that they believed what Adam said about WeWork's value. They followed him off a financial cliff. (laughs) And the majority of Adam's hires were new college graduates. So they didn't quite understand like how the equity worked and how unlikely the chance of it actually being worth any anything significant was so Adam was telling them that you know they were literally going to be millionaires like and he told them this all the time and constantly probably the second or third month that I was working at we work 10 at night uh, we've been working generally that late if not later every night and Adam comes up to me and he says how does your girlfriend feel about the fact that you're working such late hours that you're at work all the time I said, oh, you know, she gets it. He says, well, what does she think about the fact that we're going to be growing outside of New York and we're going to be, you know, all over the world and you're going to be traveling a lot and you might not be home for a while. And jokingly, I said, oh, we're just going to break up. Like, that'll be it. Sarcasm is generally lost on him, it seems. And he got very serious and he said, she is dating one of the founding members of Google. If she breaks up with you, it's going to be a big mistake. And they saw Adam, like, being successful. So, of course, they're going to believe him. And... I'll talk more about the equity when I talk about the IPO, which hold on, hold on for that because the IPO is the craziest part of this whole thing. And also what I've noticed Adam is doing in the interviews that he's started doing now is that he is hiding behind this, oh, I'm not going to talk about it or we're doing something privately because he fucked these people over, like absolutely screwed them so that he could walk away with billions. And all of these employees not only didn't get the equity, but a huge, huge chunk of them all lost their jobs. So Adam, by saying like, oh, we're going to do something for them privately, people like him shouldn't be allowed to get away with with saying stuff like that because he has shown in the past that all he cares about is his own enrichment. And by hiding behind that, he's probably not doing anything for them, but he is so shady and a liar and just 
only cares about his own self-enrichment, that he should be disclosing exactly what he's doing for these people that were fucked over. So we're gonna talk more about some of the craziness that just went on within the company. And probably to me, one of the biggest things that just perfectly showed you how much Adam didn't give a fuck about his employees and all he cared about was himself and his own ego and his own bank balance was this thing called summer camp and summer camp was basically held once a year it was an event for the staff and the members of WeWork which is what they called the people who rented desks and offices from them and they all went to summer camp which was in the beginning an event that was held at a kids summer camp upstate and you went there and it was a few days like a long weekend And they did things like archery and, you know, assault courses and stuff like that. But it pretty much was just drinking all day and night. And during the day, they used to have to listen to basically Adam, Rebecca, Miguel doing speeches on stage and talking about how great and important they were and then everybody got absolutely annihilated drunk and all of the staff had to stay in tents and I know this probably sounds great to like college age kids or like in your 20s but personally I couldn't think of anything worse. I don't drink and going and sleeping in a tent while tons of people are drunk around me, that does not sound like a good time. They would address the crowd, uh, talking about whatever word of the day that was, like authenticity. And as we're sitting in the mud, I'm thinking, well, you forced me to come to this summer camp and sit in the mud. Nothing about this to me seems authentic. And especially listening to someone like Adam and Rebecca, who I can maybe see Adam like as the CEO and I guess a bunch of people liked him, but to have Rebecca Newman there doing hour long conversations, like what, like what have you achieved that is worth talking about? Like you were born rich and you have money like that that's your accomplishment in the world and it just seems as though the entire weekend was about feeding Adam and Rebecca's egos expected to be smiling if you weren't attending summer camp you had to have a real reason to not be able to go and it had to be in writing there were no excuses not to go. And I, don't, I think they probably didn't give a shit if you were a nursing mother or you just have your pancreas out, like you were going to summer camp. And if you didn't clock in every day, you'd be fired. And while the early days it was at this camp, in later years, it just got bigger and crazier and more flashy. And at first, everybody obviously is mainly in the New York office. And yeah, there's people all around the globe, but that's where the huge majority of people are. And one year they had it in California, they flew everyone there. Another year they did it in London. But I'm sure if you would have polled the employees and said, you can have this summer camp thing, or you can have, I don't know, a $2,000 bonus, I can almost guarantee you 99% of people would choose the bonus. And that's how you see how people really are. Like, if you were looking out for your employees and wanting to do something for them, give them money. Like, give them a livable wage first before you're even talking about bonuses. And the fact that, like, Adam wanted this instead, it's just because this, he has money, he has everything he wants, and this is just a weekend of, like, feeding his ego and him and Rebecca acting like that they're, you know, the second coming. Also, women spoke about being sexually harassed, like, every second that they were at this thing. There's people who talked about waking up in the night and people were like peeing on their tents. Like, as I said, I could not think of anything worse. Like, can you imagine if you're someone who doesn't drink or you're someone who has like kids at home and you're having to take a whole weekend to 
go and listen to Rebecca Newman talk crap? Like, oh my god, I couldn't think of anything worse. Anything in the mission of what we're doing. So let's just close our eyes for one second. Close eyes, hold hands. The way of these events worked was that you would go hear presentations for like almost eight hours a day for maybe two or three days. So by the time summer camp be started becoming a thing, Adam went back and decided to rewrite the company history and he added Rebecca as a founder of the company. Again, even Miguel, his co-founder, slowly was shunted aside. Adam wanted the spotlight and he wanted Rebecca to share the spotlight. She became a bigger executive at WeWork and it speaks to kind of her power with Adam and with the company that over time it's kind of like, oh, now there are three co-founders. There's Adam, Miguel and Rebecca. Because she was having an acting career while the company was being founded and basically what that meant was she spent a hundred thousand dollars making a 15 minute movie with Rosario Dawson who I think that was like the best deal anyone's ever made for <laughs> 15 minute movie she made like a fortune Are you okay? What are you on right now? I'm on anything, Robin. <laughs> Rebecca was Adam's wife, and she had an office with us because she was a filmmaker or an actress. <laughs> and the fact that Rebecca couldn't be successful after literally buying her way in, and she has two cousins that are successful actresses, Gwyneth Paltrow and Kate Manning, like, that's the, that says a lot. And that's when she decided she wanted to retroactively be added in as a company founder. And people talk about all the arguments that would go on between Adam and Rebecca, like screaming matches, because Rebecca wanted to go by like 17 different titles. And they were trying to tell her like, this looks ridiculous, which anyone who's spent even a monochrom of time in the real world and in a real job would know that that's ridiculous. So back to summer camp and they actually wanted to make sure that people were listening to these these talks So they had them wear tracking bracelets to make sure And to make sure that people were actually attending We had tracking bracelets on and all of the, the company employees that were in the Hulu documentary and the HBO one, they all said that they know people who were literally fired for not going to summer camp, leaving early, going late, they didn't go to some of the talks, and there's a couple of people in the documentaries who said, you know, I went one year, it wasn't for me, I hated it, and I tried to get out of it, and a lot of the people were like, literally, it doesn't matter if you're a nursing mother or you got like a kidney transplant, like, you were going to summer camp. So, of course, while everyone else was slumming it down in the tents and, you know, in the middle of nowhere so you couldn't really do anything else, Adam and Rebecca were, of course, you know, living the high life as they always do. And in the book, Billion Dollar Loser, there's a list of all the requirements that they listed for going to summer camp. And it is insane the amount of money that these people spent on a weekend. They literally had employees stock up. They had like these really fancy trailers and they got about probably 10 of their employees salaries, annual salaries in alcohol and food. And just there's, there's even super ridiculous stuff like, I won an S-Class Mercedes for Adam to use and a Range Rover for Rebecca to use and just all of the, and of course they wouldn't drive themselves, you know, like peasants. So there was just the most insane, insane stuff. You know, no summer camp would be complete without a $2,000 bottle of tequila. So as I said, I looked at the numbers they spent on this thing too. And if they literally really cared about their employees, well, one, they should have been paying them a livable wage. 
But if they would have given them a four-day weekend and given them all $2,000, I I think they all would have been super happy with that. But instead, they spent millions on Adam and Rebecca's ego boost and having a weekend partying and cheering and staying in luxury, even though that was their entire life. So weekends are fun like that when you're literally a billionaire and you're going back to living in luxury and flying on private jets and your army of nannies to look after your kids and housekeepers and drivers and cooks. But these people think that perks and summer camp and cold brew and beer on tap makes up for not having a livable wage. As I said earlier, like Adam and Rebecca were just so, so out of touch with reality, having grown up privileged and then entered that realm of insane privilege. And I actually found this interview that just, it it really was wild because it's with uh, Rebecca and Gwyneth Paltrow and basically Rebecca tries to claim that she grew up down this dirt road in basically a tree house and I mean Gwyneth Paltrow in the interview is like oh she's being modest like she you know her family was exceedingly exceedingly rich and they had this enormous mansion and you know her mom had every possible like room done insanely nice and I I just mean like if Gwyneth Paltro is calling out your bullshit like you seriously need to re-examine your life because Gwyneth Paltrow is full of some absolute bullshit and literally in this interview she is like can't take it because she's like you like Gwyneth Paltrow is telling you you are privileged like you are beyond privileged and to then try and deny it like it really just uh, is, it's it's unbelievable. I mean, a lot of this whole we work is expanding the world's consciousness and raising the world's consciousness and all this stuff. A lot of that yoga babble comes from Rebecca. So let's just close our eyes for one second. Close eyes, hold hands. Just think about a reality in which the energy that we're feeling right now with one another is an energy of unity, an energy where I am you and you are me and we all are we. And by extension, Adam. And when these people like have all this time to talk about elevating the world's consciousness and they don't realize that they have the time to fixate on these things because they aren't weighed down or even dealing with the normal everyday things that the rest of the world has to deal with, like jobs and kids and where am I going to pay for this bill? And whenever you are a literal billionaire and you have money to do whatever you want, so you're not ever thinking about money, they literally have an army of staff. They talk in the book about how the Newmans literally had like hundreds of people working for them and they all wore these white polos with like a N stitched on them and they just had nannies and drivers and cooks and things like you are not having to do anything in life but talk about this rubbish that like not regular people are not going to be concerning themselves with because they have to actually like live their life and do things and I'm going to move away now from Rebecca and from summer camp and all that stuff and move more into the investment stuff and Adam's lifestyle. But I want to leave you with, with one of the top, top Rebecca Newman quotes. And that is, a woman's role in this world is to find a man and to help that man achieve their potential. That's not taken out of context. That's not, you know, taking words out. That literally is what she said at summer camp to employees. That 
added to the all male board, the fact that to get ahead at the company, you had to be a white male bro of Adam's or Adam's family member or Rebecca's family member. Adam is quoted as saying he thinks nepotism is great. And when women in the company start asking how they can get, you know, into some better roles or how to get up the ladder, he literally told them that they should look into marrying his family members. So these are the sort of people that you're dealing with here. So after Masa's investment of just over a billion into WeWork, Adam and Rebecca's spending just went into overdrive. As I mentioned, they bought, well, the company bought a $60 million jet that only they used. And he started buying up buildings, as I mentioned before too. The trademark that I mentioned that he sold back to the company. There was jets, there was cars, there was houses in the Hamptons, multiple houses in the Hamptons, nearly a dozen homes, just insane amounts of money. But there was also just lunacy going on inside the company as well because they would do things like okay they got a new building and they needed to get furniture in the building well if if I'm opening you know three buildings a week every week of the year I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna buy bulk furniture from somewhere cheap and get a good deal on it and you know get it in those buildings but they did that and then they decided no we don't like that furniture and literally a you know a few days before the building was scheduled to open they would go and buy new furniture at basically retail costs and spend a fortune getting it overnight shipped and then the stuff from before that was already bought in bulk in you know, way in advance, they just basically sold that to their employees for a hundred bucks. And like that sort of management within a company just shows you the absolute lunacy that was happening in there. And the edge that they might've been bringing to negotiations is gone. Plus, of course, everyone talks. And so if everyone knows that SoftBank has given these guys a ton of money, are you really gonna let them cry poor or drive a really hard bargain? You're gonna say, no, you know, you guys have billions of dollars, you know, let us in. There was also enormous displays of ego and arrogance by Adam. Adam was smoking so much pot on the private jet that the air staff had to deploy their oxygen masks at one stage. And another incident on board the private jet before his $60 million one was ready, it was on another one, he had brought marijuana onto the flight and hadn't smoked at all, so he shoved it in a cereal box when he landed in Israel. And when he went out, you know, to his meeting, the staff, of course, flying from somewhere where marijuana wasn't legal, New York, into somewhere where it wasn't legal, Israel, that they could be done for transporting narcotics. So they called the company that that was their boss and they recalled the jet and left Adam stranded in Israel. But of course, he just got another one. And there is a host of other private jet companies that they destroyed the insides of the jet with spitting alcohol on each other, with smoke damage, and just people throwing up from drinking so much. And the company was constantly billed for all of the cleaning services. And the drinking culture at WeWork was just completely out of control. And Adam would constantly miss meetings for either still being drunk, being hungover, getting himself into all sorts of situations. And he had this very erratic schedule that he forced upon everyone else. And that didn't matter whether you were in the New York office where he was or whether you were on the other side of the globe it was pretty common for Adam to hold meetings at 8, 9, 10, midnight, 
two in the morning and it didn't matter what time it was, anywhere, wherever you lived, you were expected to be there. And sometimes say the meeting was at eight o'clock at night in New York, that would be 1 a.m. in the UK, 2 a.m. in Europe, and Adam would call the meeting but then show up like an hour two hours late because he'd gone out drinking and people were just expected to wait around for him because he was constantly late and constantly didn't show up because he I mean I think if anything people have started to get the picture that he is just a selfish selfish huge ego individual that he couldn't care less about anyone else and he only cared about his own time. Adam was extremely arrogant thinking that he and his company could redefine work. Just like the insanity of that is astounding but he wasn't satisfied with just redefining work he and Rebecca thought that they could also redefine education and Rebecca decided that even though she has absolutely no qualifications or education or experience in education that she would open a school because when she was trying to put her kids in school in New York, none of the many, many, many private schools were quite good enough for her kids, you know, who are just oh so special. And she decided to start this school that just from beginning to end, it sounds like an absolute disaster. You know, when you see a startup that's in the commercial real estate sector, investing in an indoor wave pool company and in a children's school you know something has gone wrong and you may wonder what is the tuition for this disaster of a school what what can i expect to pay for my children to go there and the answer would be forty two thousand dollars a year for elementary education I could do a video just on this school itself because it, the absolute lunacy that went on there as well is is astounding. They hired teachers and people that did actually have experience in education and they just were tormented by Rebecca. I mean, they their life was pretty much a holiday most of the time. So when they would take the kids away for, you know, a month or two months so Adam could go surfing, the teachers at the school, like, basically had this, like, nickname for when Rebecca was away and it was, like, a festival (laughs) because they just couldn't wait to see the back of her because she caused absolute chaos. She had no idea what she was doing. She had no experience, education, qualification, nothing. And any time the the teachers were trying to actually teach in the school, she just undermined everything they did, even using the school as basically a location to throw parties at the weekend. And then when the teachers would come in on Monday, the place was absolutely destroyed from the party. They, of course, didn't clean up after themselves because what did I say before? They only care about their own time. They're, you know, they're the most selfish people. So the teachers had to run around on Monday morning cleaning up after them. And then to add even more insult to injury, their kids had been like climbing around on, like, I guess they had like statues and, and like decorations and stuff in the school. And of course the kids were allowed to do whatever they wanted. So when Monday came and the kids are like climbing all over the place, the teachers would say, get down. And the kids would be like, oh, we were allowed to do this at the weekend. So the teachers basically were just like having to deal with the fallout of their weekend of partying at the school. Of course, falling in line with WeWork, they paid absolute peanuts again. Like they just treated these people that worked there like shit, which again falls in line with WeWork. 
And whenever the head teacher was giving like cost of living raises, which is generally, you know, one, two percent, it's a really small amount. Rebecca basically threw like a fit and said that these teachers should, should be so privileged to work here and why are they concerning themselves with money? And uh, most of the teachers said that it was like super obvious that, I mean, I, who can be surprised that she has like no concept of the value of money because she's just basically always had her dad's money. She's never had to work or doesn't know the value of, of working or what it's like to have to pay bills. So she just thinks that people should be you know, oh, so privileged to work with her and, and, you know, shouldn't be bothering with things like money and salary whenever they can have the privilege of working for her. It won't be any surprise for me to tell you, you know, spoiler alert, but the school opened in 2018 and it closed in 2020. But they actually have whenever we'll talk about the fallout of we work in a minute but they re- retained the education curriculum from the school which was called regrow and now they're going to open another school that is going to be called soulful i'll put the spelling on the screen because it's a lunatic spelling of course yeah uh good luck <laughs> if you send your kids to soulful because they're going to need some luck because they won't have an education. But I suppose people who are sending their kids to this sort of school have money that I'm sure their kids will inherit and not have to work either. So maybe go for it. Before we go into part three, which is the IPO part, which as I said, is kind of the craziest part. I just wanted to touch on the sexism again and the very sexist environment that was being peddled at WeWork. As I mentioned before, the entire board was male and pretty much all of the higher up positions at WeWork were male. The male executives at WeWork were treated like royalty and Adam had his favorites which were rewarded handsomely for their loyalty and all of Adam's family and male higher-ups received much more equity than anybody else and certainly more than female staff. The culture at WeWork was also aggressively male and Adam even took to interviewing women for promotions and asking them if they plan to become pregnant, which is illegal. When female employees went on maternity leave, which maternity leave at WeWork was extremely short, Adam referred to this as vacation. When Adam's chief of staff went on maternity leave, Adam hired a man to cover for her and he paid the man double what the woman was being paid. When the woman returned, she did not go back to the chief of staff position, which is also illegal, but was instead given a desk with Adam's assistance. And it's illegal for someone to return to a lesser position just because they went on maternity leave. When she went on maternity leave a couple of years down the road again, Adam did the same thing and hired a man. And then when the woman returned, Adam told her that the man was too involved with his own brand and that he needed her to basically do his work even though the man was being paid double her salary. There was also an extensive number of sexual harassment claims and there was even one woman who put in a claim after being sexually harassed at summer camp and when Adam and Miguel became aware of the claim being put in, they asked other employees to dig up photographs and evidence of the woman drinking at company events so that they could basically put these pictures and some sort of narrative out to damage her story and they also were discussing planting fake stories about her and many employees cite this sexual harassment claim and Adam and Miguel's reaction to it as when they really saw what the company was like and what Adam, Miguel and Rebecca were really like too. 
So we're going to move into the last part where we're going to talk about the IPO, Adam's Golden Parachute, and what happened. In less than one year, we work went from one of the most highly valued startups of all time to losing more than three fourths of its value, ousting its rock star CEO, and desperately needing a cash bailout from its biggest investor just to keep the lights on. Basically, Massa was going to buy out a lot of WeWork stock and it was going to make Adam and some of the employees wealthy and it was going to give WeWork a ton of money. Essentially a plan for SoftBank to spend about $20 billion and become a majority owner of WeWork. Because of SoftBank's money, they were spending as if they were going to have this deal done and burning so much capital to keep growing. There was this hole, this future hole coming that they were going to need a lot more capital to fill it. And so kind of everything was working towards this goal of this SoftBank partnership. Adam took Massa at his word and started spending like crazy, but the deal hadn't actually been done yet because Adam still was trying to get more. And due to Adam extending the timeline of the deal because he was trying to get more and more, they ended up getting to the period of Christmas. And when Massa then tried to float the deal, it basically, the markets decided they didn't like it. And Massa was not in a situation anymore to be able to do the deal. So Adam selfishness and want for even more basically put them in this position where Massa called Adam on Christmas Eve and said, the markets don't like this. I'm sorry. I can't go through with it. And the deal was dead. And then Adam gets a call from Massa on Christmas Eve, basically telling him, sorry, I can't go through with it. The market's working against me. Investors don't like it. We just can't make it work right now. So Adam knows he is screwed. He brings along Ashton Kutcher as this pump-up guy. And it, it, it was really disingenuous. It's above and beyond what we need to fund a company for the next okay. four to five years. Adam was saying things that were completely false. WeWork was currently a bonfire of cash and was going to run out of money by the end of the year. No one else can give him the money that Masa has and no one will give him any more money because they know that Masa and SoftBank have the money. So there has to be some reasoning as to why they're not going through with it. When Masa decides he's not going to put that money in, Adam Newman had a problem because he had nowhere else to go. Nobody else is going to write him a check because... Everyone knows SoftBank has the money, so if SoftBank's not putting in more money, there must be a problem. Like it or not, they're going to need more money somehow. So the only thing Adam can do is to take the company public. So, yeah, I, I hate to press, but are, are you no, taking an IPO or not? Ever? You went like this. You mean ever? No, no I said no, no, I, I promised you, I promised you a monetizing, I promised you a monetizing event. Coming. I just didn't guarantee it's the old, it's not only way to make money in the world. I'll, I'll give you, I'm not going to give you the full answer. Well, let me ask you a question. Are you going to apologize about choosing us as one of the three unicorns to bet against? <laughs> and then after your answer, I'll, I'll give an answer. I'll stick to my bets. An option. We are ready for an IPO. You are ready? We work is always ready for an IPO. We will choose the right time to do it when it's correct for the mission of the company. What are you looking for? I want to elevate the world's consciousness. Okay, so and when that, you do that, then you can go public? It's not the one or the other. When I feel that to achieve okay. that mission, going public will help it, that will be the day. And in order to do an IPO, you have to put together a document called an S. One. An S1 is a form you have to fill out. It's a precursor to going public. It's a first introduction to your company, to the world, where you're representing that these are the facts. 
But that means you gotta come clean, and there are a lot of details in there. And we were case the devil was in the details. And this document basically goes over everything. You have to disclose all your financials. You have to disclose everything. And when the S one is put together and sent out, you also can't respond to anything in the S one. It has to stand alone. So over a very short period of time, Adam and Rebecca and their staff put together this S1 and honestly, you have never seen anything like this in your life. Rebecca is very involved in the part of the document that people laughed at and they were spending a lot of time in the Hamptons and they had this sort of constant string of WeWork employees who would get a seaplane or helicopter to go out to the Hamptons just to meet with them on some IPO stuff. Adam and Rebecca treated it as if it was their own personal coming out party when in reality it's supposed to be a financial document and I mean, some of the stuff in this S1 is just the most insane thing that anyone has ever read. The reaction to it was absolutely wild. Were you anticipating WeWork's S1 when it came out? No, I remember I was on vacation. It was in August. And I remember telling my family when someone sent me a link to it and I started reading the first few pages, I said, I apologize. I'm out for the weekend because this was just too good and I needed to read through this. It felt more like a uh, a novel written by someone who was shrooming than an S1. Basically, everyone tore it to shreds. There was so much in this S1 that people didn't know what to focus on first because everything you read, it was more lunacy, more lunacy. And all it did was paint Adam and Rebecca as two of the most selfish, out of touch, narcissistic, ego-driven maniacs that anyone has ever seen. Because this, when this S1 was published, like the reaction to it, I've never seen a reaction like this ever. With many of these unicorn IPOs, the CEO was mentioned anywhere between 12 and 40 times. In the case of Adam Newman, it was 170 times. If you tell a 30-something male that he's Jesus Christ, he's inclined to believe you. I'm going to put some great clips in here because some of the reactions to the S1 from some of the people in the documentaries are way better than I could ever say. People agree just that he would have his 20 to 1 voting shares or I can't believe the company is paying him $6 million for the trademark to the word we and the company name. He was buying buildings and then asking WeWork to lease those buildings from him. So the S1 filing exposed absolutely everything. And people had been telling Adam and Rebecca for as long as they'd been preparing this document that it was going to be a disaster. Adam and Rebecca just seemed completely oblivious to their own lunacy that they'd created. And the fact that WeWork was burning a hundred million dollars a week, the fact that they burned three times the cash they ever made is just absolutely crazy. And throughout the S1, which I've left a link to in the description box because honestly, if, if you want to have a laugh, please go and read some of it yourself because it truly has to be read to be believed. So the first red flag was on page one. It says, we dedicate this to the energy of we greater than any one of us, but inside each of us. I mean, for God's sakes, they're running fucking desks. And the fact that these people put this together and not only thought it would satisfy investors and then new people, the public, would literally say, oh, this sounds like a great idea. I'm going to put my hard-earned money into this. And in a way, the public is what held 
this company accountable because usually when it comes to things like companies like this, they are able to fool people. Like they were able to fool a lot of the big banks, a lot of the big investment groups, and it was the public who held them accountable and said, this isn't right. And the cracks really, really, you know, they formed and they were splitting off the second that this S1 came out. And when I say people ripped it to shreds, that that doesn't even begin to cover it. Professor Scott Galloway from NYU's School of Marketing was one of the best responses to the entire thing and he had actually caught flack earlier on because way before people were thinking that WeWork was a sham, he published an article saying that he believed WeWork was the most overvalued company in the entire world and there was a lot of people annoyed by that so he bided his time and in the end he was right because there was so much stuff in this S1 that just made it even worse. And Adam and Rebecca were completely shocked. You just keep reading it and be like, my God, did anyone pro- like look at this and tell them what it was going to look like? The reality is that like people had been telling Adam that for a while, but he didn't care. He thought that people would look past it or, or he wanted to enrich himself and thought... By the reaction to this, because not only did they think investors were going to put money in, they actually thought they were going to garner praise for what was being disclosed in this document. They thought that the small amount of money that they were going to donate to charity would cover all of, you know, the huge amount of corruption that had been going on and funding their own insanely lavish lifestyle. And sometimes that's what makes people like Adam and Rebecca and all the likes, you know, Elizabeth Holmes and Mark Zuckerberg and all the other ones, it what makes them the most dangerous is that they actually believe that they're good people. I genuinely think that they wake up and go to bed at night thinking that they are good people and that they are doing good things in this world. And I'm not going to say they're, they're evil people. Like, I don't think that they actively want to hurt people but they are bad people they are selfish people that everything in this video everything I've ever read about WeWork has just proven time and time again that the only thing that Adam Newman ever wanted out of that company was to benefit him it was all about me 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 never about we. It was about what he could get out of we. We reported that the co-CEOs, Arnie Minson and Sebastian Gunningham, have secured themselves multi-million dollar severance packages at a time when the company doesn't even have enough cash to pay severance to its thousands of rank and file employees that it plans to lay off. Have you ever heard of anything like that before, a company not being able to afford to fire their employees? I haven't. Have you? And I know that there's some people who will say, oh, well, he did try and, you know, he he was trying to do a good thing and everything that he did was just for more and more and more to benefit himself. Like there are deals that he could have made where he would have had more money than he could ever spend in his or his kids or probably his grandkids lifetime but he wanted more and he was honestly the own architect of his own demise in the end because he would have got away with it for a lot longer if the delusion that Masa and Adam were both living in continued and Masa was able to do the deal before everything went to hell at Christmas. And Adam and Masa, a lot of the time, people think like, oh, this company's valued at X amount. It must be so profitable and doing so well. And in reality, a lot of these private companies are able to hide 
whatever they want because they don't have to disclose financials. And we've shown through WeWork that really any valuation a private company has, a lot of it is founded in delusion because honestly, these private companies can say they're worth whatever they want. And if someone's willing to pay the price, like Massa did with Adam, then it's whatever they say. So after the S1 was released, it was made abundantly clear that Adam was hurting WeWork and that is when the ousting of Adam began. Initial public offering. We have decided to postpone our IPO to focus on our core business, the fundamentals of which remain strong. The board and in particular SoftBank, its biggest investor, decide that there needs to be a big change, it needs to come from the top, and that Adam is now more of a liability toward the company than he is an asset. And it got to the stage where basically the board and advisors spoke to Adam and he threw a lot of temper tantrums and was basically saying to his bankers and advisors that he did everything right and followed everyone's advice and why was this happening to him and they all said you did nothing of the sort you followed no advice you did whatever you wanted And Rebecca had asked all the employees to stop sending her the press coverage of the S1 and what was going on because she didn't understand why everyone hated her and Adam so much, which, as I said before, just these people's own delusion is is what keeps them going. And the fact that they think that they're good people it's honestly they should employ some regular people just to be able to to have conversations with regular people and see what you know how a regular person reacts to these things because it's clear that not only are they absolutely delusional and have no concept of reality no one in their circle or circle circle has any clue what it is like to live in the real world. So Adam wasn't going to go away for nothing. So in order to get Adam out of WeWork, the company had to give him one of the biggest golden parachutes that has ever been given in the history of business. And it's just even more of a slap in the face that it went to someone like Adam, who he has benefited greatly from all of the absolute delusion and sleight of hand and lies and bullshit that he ran this company with. And the employees, of course, got absolutely nothing. And Adam literally walked away with over a billion dollars. He got paid all this money for consulting fees. He had a bill of personal expenses that was nearly 200 million that was completely wiped. There was so much money given to him. 1.7 billion to go away and to stop hurting his own company. And in the interview that I was talking about that Adam just did a few weeks ago, that it's his first interview in like two years, in that interview, he talks about how when he brought up to Rebecca that, you know, in this period, basically before he got the the deal for the 1.7, but after he knew he was being ousted, he was saying that him and Rebecca basically thought they were going to have nothing and, you know, he, he wasn't guaranteed anything and yes, it all worked out for the better and tries to play, you know, the world's tiniest violin. And these people say this, but in reality, he wasn't going to have nothing. These people aren't like normal people that have, you know, a couple of thousand in savings and that's it. Like these people, the amount of stuff and property and 
cars and jewelry and the the insanity of stuff that these people accumulate and even I'm sure their jewelry would be in the millions. They act as though everything's going to go away and yes he had loans for huge amounts but he owned like nine properties that were into the eight figures like that is not going to have you destitute so when he's doing those interviews he's playing on stuff like that by saying he didn't know it was all gonna go away and then also when he's talking about how they're quietly and privately you know helping some of the former employees out It's all just trying to save face because one, the TV series from Apple, We Crashed, is coming out and they are wanting to distance themselves from that and putting together this whole, it's a work of fiction because he's been saying that Jared Leto told him not to watch it. So I'm sure that it's not going to show them in the best light, but I mean, that's the truth. They aren't great people. Look at what they've done. And the second reason is because they've been living in in Israel for the past year and a bit, but they are planning on returning to New York and they are going to, I'm not sure what, but whether it's a business or whether it's just the school soulful or what they're up to, but they are planning a comeback. And that's the whole reason that I wanted to do this video because they are planning a comeback. They will be trying to suppress negative stories about them and to distance themselves from the We Crash TV show, or they could go the route of completely playing into it and, you know, thinking it's great because it means more publicity. I can also see that happening. So I just wanted to put together this video to make sure that it was all the information in a clear, concise way that if people had questions after We Crash comes out, that it's all here. And I really, really enjoyed not only watching the documentaries, but reading both of the books. And as I said, if you enjoyed listening to this and you have become interested in the story, definitely check out both of the books, both of the documentaries, and also there are some great articles out there. A lot of the authors of the books have written some of the articles and that's why they ended up doing the books because their articles were successful. But also, if if this is a story that you're interested in, go and read the S1 because, <laughs> I mean, the world's a mess. We could all do with a laugh, couldn't we? So what can we learn from all of this? I mean, are Adam and Rebecca Newman evil people? No. But are they bad people? Yes. Are they selfish people? Yes. I just, I cannot imagine being like this, like being so corrupted by money and power and ego. And it just seems as though Adam in the beginning, maybe there was the chance that that he maybe wouldn't have gone down this, this crazy road, but it just seems like his ego just absolutely took over and blew up. I mean, these people, they all seem to be corruptible very easily by money and power. And I'm just so sick of reading stories about anyone who gets a big chunk of money or power or is put in a position like this. And they all seem to just deep down be absolute douchebags because there's hardly anyone I can look at and think you are someone who's making the world a better place through your success. It just seems as though people are only interested in themselves, really. I also hope that some people who are going to be joining the workforce, maybe they're in college now, maybe they're in their first jobs and I hope that some people use the WeWork story to recognize 
when people are absolutely manipulating their workforce and using people's goodness against them because I've worked for some really great tech companies like I worked for Poker Stars and they were an amazing company and treated me so well and treated everyone really well after they went public it you know changed because it always does but I also worked for some terrible tech companies like Microgaming who were very like we work and very sexist and couldn't care about minorities were openly racist and homophobic too and unfortunately I think that there's more of the latter there's more companies who just want to exploit their workforce and I really hope that there's some people who see the signs in WeWork and can apply them to their own life now like normally if there's people trying to promise you something in the future or that they're promising equity or that you'll be rewarded further down the line just don't believe them because they should be rewarding you for what you're doing now with an actual livable wage and my own experience anyway is when all these companies start talking about we're all family and we're all in this together It normally is a sign of bullshit because most of the time the whole we're in this together and we, all the employees, are living normal lives and then there's some asshole flying around in a $60 million jet. So just keep your eye out when they all start talking about we're all in this together and we're a family. So Adam and Rebecca now, as I said, they pretty much disappeared after Adam was ousted and they lived in Israel for a little while. They sold some of their properties, but they are back now. And as I said, we crashed the Apple series will be coming out soon. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that. And there's no date for it being released yet, but I do know they've finished filming, so I will be eagerly awaiting its arrival on Apple. But if you made it to the end of this video, thank you so, so, so much. I know it was a long one and I really hope you enjoy it. This is the first video on my second channel. I do have a main channel where I mainly talk about TV shows and that's where I'll talk probably about We Crashed. And I also talk about LGBTQ stuff and movies and things. So if you want to go and follow my main channel, I'll put all the details here. And down below, I also have links to my social media, my Patreon, my merch store, and my cat's Instagram, and pretty much everything you could possibly want, Twitter and all that stuff is linked down below. But I really hope you enjoyed this video. I so enjoyed making it. It was very very different from my normal style and I do have a second video planned for this channel in a similar vein and I will be talking about Elizabeth Holmes and the Theranos everything because I have followed that case for well before it was even a fraud. I started following that case because I believed she was a fraud and lo and behold, she is. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm really looking forward to covering that and I hope that you will come back for that. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel and make sure that you leave a big thumbs up if you enjoyed the video and don't forget to let me know your thoughts down in the comment section. So thank you so, so, so much for watching. Make sure that you take care of yourself and I hope that I'll see you next time. So as always, stay safe and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.